Despite many objections from the car, we have managed to put 1,400 miles on it, making it all the way from Arizona to southeastern Texas. Clearly, the Pinto has at least a few problems, and we'll try to improve upon some of them before we get back to driving. And luckily for us, we have some friends who were excited to help. But who did we trick into letting us bring this thing into their workspace? Many of you are already familiar with Ronald Finger from his YouTube channel Fingerprints Workshop. He managed to fully restore this Pontiac Fiero and film, edit, and upload a series covering the whole thing in the same amount of time it's taken me to change the oil on mine. So yeah, luckily for me, out of the kindness of his heart, he has agreed to help with the Pinto. Almost as if Ronnie knew we were on our way, he had a space set up in the barn for us. He's got a two-post lift in there, and it'll make some of the things we're looking to do a whole lot easier. And with the arms in place, we'll get the car pulled in. We did have a little bit of trouble figuring out where to place the pads so that they would be out of our way and support the car such that it doesn't want to tip over. We're really not sure what kind of weight balance this car has, so once the wheels are off the ground, we'll make sure it won't be going anywhere. Than I am. Ah, it looks like it's tilting back to me. It is tilting back because it's, it's on the rail. Frame rails on the front. Uh, it's not the most perfect solution, but it does seem sturdy and should be safe. And of course, having the car a few feet in the air gives us a much better look than we've had before at the underside. It's mostly as expected, the car body itself is in very good shape, and there's oil splattered back from the transmission on pretty much everything behind it. The oil seems to be kind of everywhere, so it's probably mostly a leaking pan gasket. We could also more clearly see the damage to the exhaust flange from when it fell off on the highway and even found a few unexpected issues. One of the most concerning of which were the parking brake cables. It seems that they have enough movement and the tires are wide enough that they're rubbing their way through the inner sidewall, especially on the passenger side. They haven't made it all the way through the outer layers of rubber yet, and to make sure they don't, we'll have to address this before we leave. But before getting to that, the first things we'll take care of are the leaf springs. Thanks to Ronnie letting me send multiple deliveries to his house, we had a few items waiting for us there when we arrived. After being unable to find anything local and shoving wood blocks in the car's suspension so that we could actually drive it, I had ordered these leaf springs back at that El Paso gas station at 4 in the morning. These were the highest capacity option and only listed as fitting a 74 to 78, but I doubt a whole lot changed in the two years since then. To go along with those, we have a pair of new shocks for the back, as well as the extenders that I was trying to get back in Arizona. These shocks should be equivalent to what's on there, and they sure do look the part, albeit with a fair bit more paint showing. They seem to be the same length, which we already know is too short thanks to those extra long shackles in the back, but hopefully those extenders will give the rear suspension a lot more travel. And unlike the pair that I had gotten last time, these do actually have the right threads. The first thing we have to do is support the axle, and we'll be doing that with this tall hydraulic jack. This is the first time using this great shape. Oh boy, it might not be compatible. You're doing so good. You got it, you got it, you got it. I'm used to pumping the weed sprayers. <laughs> yeah, you've been getting practice. 
I wouldn't go up any higher because it's the shocks that are preventing it from moving, you know? Well, I'm worried about this thing. <laughs> yeah, it's still oh, it's supposed I to be see. all the way down there. This piece at the top of the hydraulic ram wasn't sitting down into place and needed a bit of encouragement. <gasps> so strong! <laughs> oh, it's not me! Okay, there you hey. go. Hey! So I definitely would have fallen down and scared the crap out of it. Yeah, Yay! Yeah, okay, Sean, take two. You're so good. So much pumping! We're in Texas, this is oil country, that's what they do. <laughs> Why did it stop making squeaky noises? And once we finally had that in place, we could lift the axle up just enough so that the shocks could be removed. We have an electric ratchet if you want to use that. No, don't spoil him. I'm not technology, guys. <laughs> Lifting up under the axle is especially important here since the shocks are so short that they're holding the leaf springs under a fair amount of tension. Sean is using channel locks to keep the body of the shock from spinning while loosening the bottom fastener. And once those have been removed, we can drop down the jack to relieve pressure on the springs and pop the shocks out of the bottom plates. To release the top ends of the shocks, we have to remove these mounting plates that bolt to the body. Pretty loose. Why would they be tight? Everybody else is loose. I was just, I wasn't surprised. I just yeah. said they're pretty loose. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks to the electric ratchet and loose fasteners, they came out pretty quickly. What wasn't coming out quite so easily were the rear leaf spring bolts. But we did eventually crack those loose and get both of the shocks off of the car. The top threaded stud on each shock simply passes through that mounting plate and needs to be tightened down off of the vehicle. How tight is this supposed to be? They're usually 12 foot pounds on I do own a torque crank shelf. Ooh. There's a Haynes manual in here, but it's pressed up against the trans tunnel to keep the burning hot exhaust yeah, gases off you. Pretty soon we have the nice shiny new shocks on there in place of those crusty old ones. While Sean worked on those, I was still working on trying to loosen up the rear leaf spring eyelet bolts. <laughs> Jesus Christ. I got it tight! Yeah, you can get it tight! Oh, I got it tight! I think the spreads are really... Oh, oh yeah, that one was weird. Oh, is this the oval one? Yeah. Intentionally or otherwise, the nut that was on there was acting like a really tight lock nut. Teamwork. Teamwork. But after a whole lot of loosening... Whoa, holy crap, that's really hot. <laughs> ah. What were you expecting? Ah. I don't oh, really know. Not hot, hot. And we'll have to do the same thing for the front bolts. Just the suspension ducts. Fine. <laughs> hey, it sounds like Maryland. It sounds like uh, Alright, I'm gonna change the cabin air filter on the Prius now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Wanna do yours while we're at it? Yeah, it's uh, pretty dirty, I think. Oh, oh sideways. Oh. Look at that. Eventually, the wrenches did prevail and the bolts were ready to come out. Gotta remove the. Uh, bump stop extenders. Those wood blocks worked great, but hopefully we won't be needing them anymore. It's not going to be Pogo anymore. Yeah. It's still Pogo. It's no. still like a thread clown car. Well, we don't have to put the shocks on it. Oh yeah. Yeah, 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 that's what I'm talking about. Next up, we'll use Ronnie's impact gun to loosen the U-bolts holding the spring plate to the underside of the leaf spring. This is our first good look at it, and you can see the holes that were drilled to get that Ford 9-inch bolted on. But getting that off wasn't the only challenge, because the spring perch was really stuck to the leaf. We'll use the floor jack to lift the axle up, and the leaf spring should do the rest. There it goes. Now, the only things holding the spring in are the loosely installed front and rear bolts. We'll start by taking out the front one. Don't tell me what to do. What are you, the YouTube comment section? And once the rear bolt is out, the whole spring pack can be lifted over the parking brake cable and set aside. While we had some access, I wanted to put washers and a lock nut on the top shackle bolts, but they were still not easy to get to. Careful around the gas thing. Yeah. yeah What's the worst thing that can happen? <laughs> it does the arrows. Good combination. Can you get that wrench off? Yes, Sean. Yeah, you just have to tighten it a little bit again. 
Now would be a good time for the ratcheting wrenches, right? Did offer that them. Would, yeah, you did. Did Yeah, you did offer yeah, them. Did yeah. offer them. It's too late. Well, there's still one more side. I don't know if you've seen our channel, but we do things the hardest possible way. <laughs> our channel. You do say we, the royal it's we. It's me and the interns. Not the worst unpaid internship ever. Can you even get that bolt all the way out? No, no way. Okay, no washers, but a lock nut would be good. Well, at the very least, it seems like the new leaf springs will fit. They both have the same number of leaves, and they're arranged in about the same way, but the new ones are a little bit shorter overall. Since the distance from the center bolt to the front eyelet is the same, it should locate the axle correctly, and they're probably close enough that it won't cause any issues. These are quarter inch thick. These are 5 sixteenths, I think. So these should be 100 pound rated springs, these should be 150. The two sides look the same to me, but there must be some small difference because they're labeled driver and passenger. And then these don't have bushings for some reason. Uh, I thought they came with them, they obviously don't. So we'll be reusing those old front bushings. We talked about a few different ways to do this, but Ronnie suggested heating them up with a torch and knocking them out with a hammer. We'll just have to be careful not to burn them up since we need these bushings to go in the new springs. I say with the Fiero, it literally just slid right out. I gave it one solid whack and it went out, so I might just still be cooking a little bit longer. Oh, it's smoking now. It's definitely sliding out. It looks like it at least. Did you just touch the metal? For a second, how did you do this? Switching between a bolt and a socket, eventually we managed to hammer them loose. If we turn it another way, it'll be brand new. Yeah. Is that what you did with everything on the Fiero? They're a little toasty. Yeah, give them that a minute. They hurt a lot. Once cooled, we'll get those brand new bushings pushed into the spring eyelet. That's OEM. Why would you show it? That works for you too. Okay, cool. Now we're ready to install that leaf spring the same way the old one came out. We couldn't decide whether it would be better to have the parking brake cable below or above the leaf spring and decided to just leave it how it was. The new springs do have a bit less arch than the old ones, so we'll have to lift the axle up more and wiggle it around until the center pin lines up on the perch before finally getting the rear bolt in. Once those are loaded up, we'll get the eye bolts, U-bolts, and spring plate reinstalled. We'll fully tighten these later. For now, we just want the driver's side to hold onto the axle while we work on the passenger side. It's not fitting on there. Here, just stack together every single extension. Cool. All of the nuts holding on the U-bolts will get removed. The bottom plate dropped out of the way. And just like the other side, the spring pack is stuck to the perch. Only this time, it's really stuck. We even took out the rear bolt and replaced it with a looser fitting one to make it easier for us to move things around, but it was still stuck in place. The dead blow wasn't doing the trick, so we switched to the steel hammer and... Good God. Woo! There it goes. <laughs> that could have been bad. Nah. There's a little more tension on that than I did. Nah, it happens. <laughs> nah, it's okay. They like to be scary. All right, time to heat it up. Always an adventure, huh? It's a little scary. This road trip's gonna be so boring. It'll be so boring. Just like on the driver's side, Ronnie used the torch to free up the bushing. This one's definitely smoking a lot faster. The technique that ended up working on both sides was hammering in a bolt to get it moving and then switching to a socket to push it the rest of the way out. And once again, we'll flip those 40-year-old bushing halves inside out to restore them and get them pressed back into the new leaf eyelet. Once again, we'll loosen the top shackle bolt in order to install a washer and lock nut. Yeah, let us stop melting. Uh -huh. With that swapped out, we'll bring over the new leaf spring. We'll get that lined up and install the front and rear bolts. There's a dead blow right there. Wow. Don't need it. Don't need it. He said it there. Anyway. Don't need this. You don't need it? Just use it again. There, he did it. You didn't and all without didn't even using need, a hammer. Didn't even need that hammer. <laughs> and again, we'll get those snug, but wait until the suspension is under load to fully tighten them. We'll get the center bolt lined up with the spring perch, 
And then it was only when I went to put the U-bolts back on that I noticed... One of these bolts is different, that's why they looked funny. Yeah. Don't yeah, worry about it. The other three one. are new, and this one is old, I guess. Don't worry about it. One of them's longer than the other one. We'll also go ahead and reinstall the shock absorber, getting that upper mounting plate bolted back to the body. Then we'll slather on some Loctite and get the shock extender tightened down onto the lower shock stud. Then we can install the spring plate and get the shock lined up and in place just like any normal installation. We'll thread back on, then snug down all the fasteners before finishing up the rear suspension by installing the driver's side shock absorber. Other than tightening a few bolts, the rear suspension is totally back together, but there are a few other things I wanted to take a look at while it's on the lift. Normally, these axles will have a breather at the brake junction, but this one is missing that. I think this threaded hole is to hold down the brake line on this side, but it's not being used to do that right now, and it is clearly leaking, so let's pull that out and see what's going on. Well, that was unexpected, but at least now we know where the oil has been coming from. This bolt was turned into a DIY axle vent. And while it's better to have something like this than nothing, it was clearly not stopping oil from exiting the system. Unfortunately, I wasn't quite prepared and hadn't got the right kind of breather bolt for the axle, so this one is gonna have to stay for now. The worst I think it'll do is just keep leaking oil. The other big concern at the rear of the car is something we mentioned earlier, that would be the parking brake cables that are rubbing on the rear tires. That passenger side tire doesn't look great, but it's not through the outer layers of rubber yet, so hopefully it's not going to cause any problems. To make sure it doesn't get any worse though, we will need to pull the cables inward and away from the tires to get more clearance. The cables are very loosely held to the body of the car with these clips, so all we need to do is slide it inward and put something on there to keep it from sliding back out. I decided to reinforce the anti-rub foam with electrical tape and then hold the cables in place against those body side clips with hose clamps. We made sure there was enough wiggle room for articulation of the axle, but little enough that the cables can't come into contact with the tires again. It's a simple solution, but it should do the trick just fine. Something else I wanted to take a look at that is a bit less critical is that bent exhaust flange. It's too far apart to get a 3 eighths of an inch bolt through, but I did manage to get it bent back far enough with channel locks to get a 5 16 bolt through and started tightening that down. This provided a lot more clamping force and was able to pull the flange a bit closer together. Enough so to get a correctly sized bolt through, which we can tighten down the rest of the way. Of course, it's still not pretty and there isn't a gasket in there, but at least there isn't a big hole blowing exhaust right out in front of the muffler anymore. While I was messing with that stuff, everybody else was at the front of the car getting ready to remove the radiator. Yep, we wanted to have one more go at getting the last of the stuff out of it that we weren't able to previously. It's already getting everywhere. It's just water. <laughs> and our TV and whatever brown crap is in it. Sean is working on the lower radiator hose, and Ronnie took a look at the drain on the other side. Yeah, I can't get it to turn either way. So. Oh, I just got it. Oh, okay. Well, <laughs> stronger than I am. Oh, I didn't lose it. I just broke it. Yeah, never mind. My, I found this broken thing over here. Oh, weird. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Do you want me to help you hold the bucket up there while you do that? Well, I got it. I got it. The bucket. I'll hold my hand. Oh no! Good stuff. Good stuff. Oh, it's so sudsy still. Fully disconnecting the radiator also meant removing the trans cooler lines, and well, you know they're a little sketchy. I'm scared. Should I come over there? Yeah. It is a possibility. Yes. That stays still. That's like a fix to this crimp part from the hose. And this is an adapter into the radiator. All right, Sean, just stay there and hold those yeah. forever. Yeah, I'll be here. With those out of the way and tied up so that they don't drain the whole transmission, they can now remove the upper radiator and overflow hoses, disconnect the electric fan, and unbolt the radiator from its mounts to drop it downward away from the core support. I'm gonna hose this way. Is it okay if this gets wet? I will tape over the connector so it doesn't get wet. 
The plan this time was just to use the garden hose, slosh it all around, and hopefully the stuff sitting in the upper tank will come out. Put that nice hard well water in there. Really get some calcium buildup going. Yeah, there's little chunks. And just for good measure, we'll run some of that through the engine as well. It's definitely brown. Other than those bits that came out of the radiator, it seems to be flowing through the engine pretty cleanly. It's mostly going in the bucket. That's an interesting definition of mostly. Mostly is more than 50%. And we did <laughs> fill a drop. So now that we can at least say we really tried to get everything out of the radiator, they'll slot it back up into the car and get it bolted in place. Then everything will get reconnected and tightened down just as it was before. Except maybe like 2% cleaner. With all that done, it was most of what we wanted to take care of underneath the car, so it was time to set it back down. None of us were sure quite how stiff the rear suspension was going to be, so when it sat down and compressed a bit, that was good news. At least for now, the suspension seems a lot more firm and will hopefully be enough to keep the tires away from the fenders. And with the car back on the ground, we now have access to the coolant overflow tank, which is the last thing we wanted to run some water through. As usual, we took our time, but we definitely got some important work done today. As it was now 12 a.m., we all felt like we'd had about enough and Ronnie agreed to let us leave the Pinto in the barn overnight, so the three of us piled into the Prius and headed all the way back to the motel where we were quickly able to fall asleep. We awoke to a gorgeous sunny day and took the Prius all the way back down to Ronnie's. There are just a few, mostly smaller things I'd like to take care of on the car before we get back to driving it. I thought you would have sold the car by now. A little bit of tuning, tinkering, tidying things up, and making sure the front suspension seems solid are the main things on the docket. Hey, you add that footage, you can yeah, never yeah, yeah. anything valuable in here ever again. I really shouldn't anyway. Ronnie and I are going to be working on the Pinto, and responsible adults Sean and Rob are going to do some preventative maintenance on the Prius. They've got new oil and a fresh filter for the car, which definitely seemed like a good idea after seeing what came out. And they have a pair of new air filters for the engine and the cabin. And after doing all of that, they left for a day out on the town. They tried to have a Galveston beach day, but it was just too crowded, and they ended up spending the rest of the day at a park. Back in the barn, Ronnie and I were working, and the first thing we'll take a look at is the distributor, specifically the Vacuum Advance. I had managed to figure out that the unit on the car offered 20 degrees of Vacuum Advance and wanted something with a little bit less, so this new part should only be 12. That number is the total amount of vacuum advance they provide, and by using a hex wrench through the hose fitting, you can adjust how soon that advance comes in. One of the reasons we didn't try to adjust the old canister is that I thought it was at fault. But it turns out the diaphragm is intact, doesn't seem to be leaking, and in fact there doesn't really seem to be anything wrong with this unit at all. I figured the diaphragm was torn. Why is it stuck at 20 though? The actual problem lies at the other end of the link. This rotating assembly includes the inductive pickup, and it's what the vacuum advance unit is actually moving around to adjust the timing. Only, in this case, it's all gummed up. It barely wants to move at all. It's a little bit hard to see exactly how much force I'm applying here, but it's a lot. This explains pretty much everything about why the timing kept being so weird. When it was initially set at Andes, it was probably stuck in one position and only freed up later, which is why the timing had changed a bunch when we checked it again. It took just a few quick sprays of WD-40 and working it back and forth to totally free it up. Between the oils and solvents, something sure worked, but to make sure it keeps moving freely, we'll also add some silicone spray. This should stay put and lubricate better than just the WD-40. Despite the old one not being at fault, we'll still switch to the new canister for the decreased amount of timing that it pulls in. We'll get that in place, tighten the two hold down screws, and reinstall the link with its little retaining clip. With that back together, we can see that pulling vacuum on the hose repositions the pickup and changes the ignition timing. You know, how it's supposed to work. 
And with that sorted, it's time to once again mess with the carburetor. I had ordered a different power valve and a few jets to try, but there was only one 72 jet in the package. Back in Arizona, I had tried to get 72s and they also only had one. So instead, we'll be going all the way from a 70 to a 74, which should richen up the mixture. There is a bit of a mid-throttle bog, and I thought it might be because of the big jets and the relatively rich idle settings, so I figured a power valve that opens a bit later could be worth a try. And finally we've got a set of hex head bowl screws, which should be much easier to change out. I also picked up one of these fancy carburetor drain cups to try to minimize fuel spillage. I don't know why Ronnie's June bug friends desperately want to hide in there, but we kind of need to fill it with gas. I'm going to try to not make an enormous gas spill put. No promises. I removed one of the bowl screws to drain it and probably caught 50% of the gas. Then out come the other three screws and the balance tube. I was trying to be careful with the seals so that we could reuse them, but this outer gasket tore and the balance tube o-rings weren't looking so hot. But we'll have to make do with what we have and continue by removing the metering block. We'll go ahead and unscrew the 6.5 power valve, scrape off any gasket remains, and install the 5.5. Then out come the two 70 jets, and in go the two new 74s. With those tightened down, we'll install a new bowl side gasket and get everything back into place. As mentioned before, those old balance tube o-rings weren't looking great, but it was all we had on hand, so we were just going to have to hope that works out. We'll get that all back together and use four of the new hex head bowl screws to finish it off. The set I got is actually only going to fit on the front of this, but I only keep messing with the primaries anyway, so it's not too big a deal. While I screwed around with that stuff, probably making no meaningful improvements, I asked Ronnie to do a favor and help fit the grill onto the car. There's not really a functional reason for this, it just looks so incomplete without it. The main reason we hadn't previously installed it was that the radiator now sat so far forward, it simply didn't fit. But Ronnie marked out the parts that interfered and went to work with a die grinder to make it fit. That cutting wheel melts right through the plastic, making short work of it. We did feel a little bit bad about doing this, but the grill wasn't in perfect shape anyway and most of the mounting tabs were broken off, so at least it wasn't an immaculate piece that was getting modified. Pretty soon, that top row of fins was trimmed down enough to fit against the radiator, but it still couldn't go quite as far back as it's supposed to to mount up normally. And there's the problem of those previously mentioned broken mounting tabs. Ronnie cut and painted some PVC spacers to move it forward a little bit and zip tied it into place. For the record, Ronnie's work is usually much classier than this, but it was fun to bring him down to my level. Well, it's on there. It almost looks like it's supposed to be sticking forward like that. That's not bad! And the sprayer still fits in the bottom. So, <laughs> just in case. We spent a bit more time on fiddly jobs like fine tuning the spark plug wire separators and even spacing out the transmission dipstick tube from the firewall. It's so smashed up against there, it kept pushing off the dipstick, which is very much not ideal. It didn't seem like we were going to be able to bend it from where it currently was, but Ronnie did find a piece of heater hose that fit perfectly over it so that at least it's sitting far enough from the firewall that the dipstick can be fully installed. And hopefully, we'll stay there. We also changed out a fitting at the rear of the intake manifold so that we can properly attach a vacuum gauge. Before we start it though, we need to refill the cooling system. First up is yet another bottle of water wetter because why not, we need all the help we can get. Then we have something the car hasn't seen in a while, antifreeze. We'll be putting in about a 50-50 mix of it and distilled water. With all that done, it's time to get the engine started and make sure everything is working as it should. We'll let it turn over for a little while to fill the carburetor back up, and as soon as it has... It starts up happily and sounds like it's running pretty well. After a bit of warm up, we can let it settle down to idle and then check the vacuum reading. The engine's not totally warm, and obviously the tune isn't perfect, but we're bouncing between 12 and 13 inches of mercury at about an 1100 RPM idle. 
This is pretty well within the expected range for an engine with a camshaft like this, but it still seems a little bit more uneven than it probably should be. There could be a lot of things contributing to that, such as intake manifold vacuum leaks. For now, at least we can verify that the vacuum advance is working as intended, and we will leave it connected this time. It seems reasonably happy with the existing 6 degrees of initial timing, so we'll call that good for now, and shut the engine off to let it draw in coolant from the overflow. In the meantime, we decided it was time for some late afternoon lunch, and, well, we'd have to find something to drive. The shift light actually works, so... This feels a hell of a lot faster than the Prius. It was super cool to have the chance to roll around town in Ronnie's restored Fiero. We cruised around for a bit and chatted. It was really nice to not only not be driving for once, but not be driving the Pinto. Compared to that thing, the Fiero is a plush luxury car and an absolute pleasure to ride in. But pretty soon, we had to bring me back to reality and get back out to the barn. The biggest thing that still needs to be done is finishing up the rear suspension by torquing down all of the fasteners. We wanted the car to be at ride height to do this so that when the bolts are tightened down, the bushings are in neutral positions. And from the ground, I was able to get to everything except the front leaf spring bolts. To get to those, we'll put the lift arms back onto the car and raise it up on top of wooden blocks. This way, the suspension is still loaded, but there's more ground clearance underneath to get to the front eye bolts. And it's a final chance to make sure everything under the car, like the parking brake cables, are where they need to be. With everything looking good, the car is back together and, theoretically, ready to hit the road. Those leaf springs made a big difference in ride height and should be plenty to keep the tires from rubbing the tops of the fenders. You can also see that there's now a lot of down travel to the rear axle as the car is lifted. That's thanks to those rear shock extensions. So that's great, but why are we lifting the car all the way up into the air again? Well, since we still have a few hours of sunlight left, there's a concerning part on the front end I'd really like to change out. That's the steering lock, it's just really light. That's the ball joint. We already knew all the ball joint boots were bad, but now the driver's side lower ball joint had had about enough. Well, that's visible. Okay, that's pretty bad. <laughs> Obviously, this was going to be a problem sooner or later, so I had already ordered new ball joints. The other three still feel good for now, and it's really just this one that's begging to be replaced. So, we'll see what we can do about that. First up, we'll be removing that wheel. I still don't know what kind of lug nuts are supposed to be on this wheel because the shank ones don't fit quite right, but there's no seat for anything else. It wasn't a big surprise that those seemed a bit funny, but there was something lurking underneath the wheel we weren't expecting. That's some serious grooving. Oh wow. Got a record player if you want to put that on there, see what it plays. Cow. Uh, yeah, these rotors looked pretty good before. <laughs> are those the original those pads? Shiny. Yeah, we didn't even take the calipers off. And they're shiny like they're glazed. The brakes never felt bad, they always felt really good. On our way through the desert, something must have gotten jammed up between the brake pad and the rotor, but we never heard anything, which is one of the downsides of having such a loud exhaust. That's probably beyond service limit. I'm just gonna ignore that. We don't have the parts to do anything about that, so we're just gonna be working on the ball joint for now. The first thing we'll do is remove the old cotter pin. I was surprised to see this because I didn't feel any bumps or anything. I guess the car kind of shakes a lot anyway. Then we can loosen the castle nut. I have a old car so loose. At least that wouldn't come off. Where's my rust? Not having all the rust makes me uncomfortable. Things should be seized in place. With it still on the stud, but most of the way unthreaded, we now have to separate the tapered stud from the steering knuckle, which it really didn't want to do. Clearly, I spoke too soon about things not being seized. After a bit of hammering and prying that went nowhere other than trying to knock the car off of the lift, we'll go ahead and separate the tie rod from the steering knuckle so that we can get better access to the lower ball joint. 
<laughs> Luckily, this one came loose without a big fight. Unfortunately, the boot is torn and there's no grease fittings, so before we put this pack together, we'll probably try to grease it by hand. For now, at least the tie rod is out of the way and there's enough room that Ronnie was able to install this ball joint separator. We'll get a ratchet on that and start cranking down on it, hoping that it'll do the trick. There it is. Yeah, that would have been hard without that. No, it's nice and greasy. Find it easier next time. Yeah. With that end separated, now we have to work out how to remove the ball joint from the lower control arm. It's attached in four places, two of which are the studs going through the strut rod, and two of which are big rivets that we're going to need to remove. To get those out of there, we'll be using a cutting disc on an angle grinder. Oh yeah, and we don't cut all the way through the control. I definitely cut a little of the fierce control over, it's fine. If we're able to cut the flattened off heads off of the rivets, then we should be able to just knock them out with a hammer. And after going back and forth between hammering and grinding and hammering, it's starting to come loose. Then we can spin the knuckle around and repeat the same process to cut the head off of the rear rivet. Except, the thing just wouldn't budge. In an attempt to make everything more rigid, we decided to drop the car down a bit and place the lower control arm up against a block of wood. We'll also go ahead and remove the two fasteners holding the strut rod to the control arm and ball joint. Oh, there it goes. That one was pretty good. Yeah, that one was pretty good. And with those out of the way, the only things holding in the ball joint are years of dirt and the mangled heads on those rivets but they still seem pretty stuck in there, so we'll go ahead and mangle them a bit more. This was when Sean and Rob returned from their outing. Well, hello there. Oh, up and down the seawall, and there were no parking spots, so I had to play some disc golf. Hey! Totally nothing weird happened with the Prius at all. Zero percent weirdness. When normal things happen with the Prius. Every once in a while when you turn the car on, you don't have any of the speedo or like oh. mileage or anything like that. If you turn it on, then you hold the climate button for five seconds, and you turn the headlight on, uh -huh. it turns back on. <laughs> so it works now again. Clearly, things were going well for all of us, but there was progress being made in here at least. Hey, there we go. And after a few more cycles of hammering, including some with an air hammer, followed by having Sean hit the ball stud as hard as he could, The rear rivet finally got knocked loose. Aha, I got the back one. And once that happened, the front wasn't far behind. Yeah! With that finally out, there was some bare metal showing on the lower control arm, and Ronnie wouldn't let me leave without letting him cover it up with some paint. Fortunately for us, the new ball joints do match the old ones, and they include new hardware to replace those pesky rivets. Oh no, we're putting metric hardware on the car! Metric? No! Oh, finally, it'll work fine now. Once those two main bolts are in there, we can drop on the steering knuckle and the strut rod. Then we'll get all of that tightened down and, more or less, torque to spec. And we can tighten down the ball joint castle nut, only to realize that we're gonna have to put a washer on top of there to space it out enough so that the cotter pin is actually where it should be but that'll do just fine and we'll get it torqued down. We'll get a cotter pin pushed through there, a zerk fitting installed, and fill the joint with grease. Then the tie rod needs to go back in, but I figured I should at least try to re-grease it. We'll pull off what's left of the boot, clean it up as well as we can, and apply some new grease. Basically, just trying to work as much of that into the joint as possible. We don't have another boot though, so... <laughs> that's, that's how they did it in the Ford factories. Yep. Plop the dirty ass rubber on top of it. We'll pop that back into the knuckle and reinstall the castle nut, making sure to torque it down. Oh hey, if you turn the wheel all the way to the right, it rubs on the transcooler lines. We should probably move those. Oh, Rain. Ah, uh, rain. My window's so Yes, it is. Wrong, John. I'm not gonna run. Sean may not need a raincoat, but I feel like the tie rod joint probably does, so I went ahead and made a boot for it. Yeah, this is the point we're at. It's starting to get pretty late, so we'll finish up on that front driver's side corner and start gathering up our stuff. 
It's been a blast here at Ronnie's, and the Pinto is so much better off than it was, but we do need to get back on the road. Thanks to that grill, the car will already look a lot better rolling out of here, but I want to take it one step farther. It's certainly a display of unearned confidence, but I'd really like to put the hood back on. Somewhat for the looks, but mostly because we're getting out of the desert into slightly cooler areas and even starting to see rain. There shouldn't be anything under the hood particularly susceptible to water ingress, but it's also probably best not to tempt fate on that one. We'll heft that hood back onto its hinges and bolt it back down. It may not be quite as utilitarian as the previous configuration, but it sure looks a heck of a lot better with the hood and grill installed. Cool, just that. <laughs> Half decent. Yeah! Hey! Half decent, half great. Yeah, that's more like it. Together it's good. If you squint really hard. Close your left eye, close your right eye. The last thing we'll do is start the engine back up. And let it run for a few minutes, try to tune it a tiny bit better, until it's about as good as I can get it given the circumstances. The engine hasn't sounded this good in quite a while, so something must be making a difference. We finished packing everything up, gave Ronnie a huge thank you, which is not enough, and backed the Pinto out of that famous red barn. Despite only being there for two days, it really did feel sad leaving. It comes across in his videos, but Ronnie really is as good and genuine of a person as he seems. It was right about midnight that we left his house and got back on the road heading back east. On the way, we stopped at a gas station to top off the tank, and, well, I think I'd better show off this. You may have noticed this already on the car at Ronnie's house, but yes, I was able to get another gas filler cap. It's certainly a lot less sticky than the tape solution, so this time I'll have to try to keep track of it. We left the gas station and got back to driving, but only for a very short period of time before having to stop again. And why do you think we had to stop? Yep, you guessed it, it was getting pretty warm. But this time, things were a little different. Once out of the car, it was clear that the fan wasn't running, and after unwrapping some tape, we found this. Clearly it's a wiring problem, I think one of the terminals was pulling out of the connector and just not making great contact, but I really just didn't want to deal with it. And uh, this was far from my proudest moment, but we couldn't find the box of crimp connectors, so I just twisted the wires together and taped them. But you know what? It worked. Now the fan was coming on with the ignition just like it's supposed to, or well, just like it did before. With that functionally repaired, we closed the hood and got back to driving. With Sean and Rob in the Prius trailing behind, I led us back up north all the way to I-10, which took us pretty much directly east. And as we headed back towards home, everything seemed to be going pretty well. The Pinto was enjoying the nighttime ambient temperature of 80 degrees Fahrenheit, and the gauge was stuck somewhere around 220. The suspension was also feeling really nice. It doesn't exactly ride like a Cadillac, but there's also not much I can complain about either. Even though we were once again driving in the middle of the night, it was a nice cruise, and I wasn't too worried the whole time about the car falling apart. But when we pulled into Vider, Texas at about 3.45 in the morning, the same could not be said for the crew in the Prius. I got out like normal, ready to fill the car with gas when I saw some commotion happening. Apparently, when Sean aggressively pulled into the gas station, one of the coolers tipped over and poured all of its water out into the back seat. You got a seafaring vessel here? No. That's the problem. Oh, jeez. 
Oh my god, Sean, I'm so sorry. How did this happen? <laughs> I don't know what to do. Uh, do you want to just try to get to another gas station that has a vacuum? Uh, I can get most of it out of here. Oh, shit. <laughs> you that whole time. It's fine, I'm just cleaning. No, my knee. Oh no, Sean, the hybrid battery. It's back there. Uh, That's why we're close to it. Did you get ahead of me because it was like stinky behind the car? You had a top speed run. Oh. What was that? That sounded like the engine was screaming and dying. Oh. That to the boy. How did it spill? It flipped over or something? The seat was folded down, and I guess after so many <laughs> jackass maneuvers, <laughs> it kind of worked its way over. Give me all the trash now. <laughs> this was honestly probably the funniest part of the whole trip to me. And I think it probably has something to do with the fact that, for once, it wasn't my car involved in the incident. Eventually, they had gotten the majority of the water out and dried the carpet reasonably well, so we were ready to get back to driving. Soon, we were once again on Route 10 heading east. That previous stretch of the drive was 106 miles, and the car took a little bit over 8 gallons, which means it was still getting right about 13 miles per gallon. At least so far, the car seemed to be responding well to the tuning changes, but it was still missing out on high-end power that it had when we first drove it. This was probably a combination of a bunch of different factors, and we were just going to have to hope it didn't get any worse before we managed to make it home. For now, though, we were able to cover a fair amount of distance and made it another 103 miles to Crowley, Louisiana. It was now 6 in the morning, which unfortunately had become a pretty standard check-in time for us. Before going to sleep, we got our important stuff out of the cars and checked out some of the motel's amenities. But quality of the establishment aside, it was nice to not be in our cars. In fact, getting away from the Pinto for a little while is our whole plan for tomorrow. Or, you know, today. In just a couple of hours, actually. So we'd better get rest while we can. Feeling at least a little bit better, at around 2pm we got up and left the motel. Through the, you know, aesthetically pleasing side door. You don't like that door, son? The plan for today is to go meet up with some friends who are staying with family nearby, and after everything we've been through with the Pinto, well, I didn't really want to drive it if I didn't have to, so we're just gonna take Sean's car. Which one is the Prius? Looking for some food before we head over there, we drove into downtown Crowley, only about two miles from the motel. Being a cloudy Sunday afternoon, the area was pretty empty even for a relatively small city. We drove around for a little while and found a few different options for places to eat, but consistently were followed by dark clouds overhead. Look at those clouds! Oh, we're gonna die. Yeah, it's supposed to rain the next week. <laughs> for now though, the sky was holding off and we eventually stopped to get some food at a small diner before heading out to meet up with our friends. This was an interesting area to be in because it's so flat, but unlike the desert, there were no mountains looming in the distance, only the clouds overhead. Of course, it's also green as can be, and there is water absolutely everywhere. Less than an hour later, we were able to meet up with our friends Colin and Sarah, yes, the same ones who were bowling in Vegas, on Sarah's family's crawfish farm. The little guys were absolutely everywhere, sticking their heads up from out of the dirt and running all over the driveway. Their properties and nearby ones are wetlands mostly used for rice and crawfish farming. This area is like a whole different world from where we were just a few days ago. And if you were making better time than us, you can make it from the desert to the marsh before losing daylight. We sure did spend a lot of time in Arizona and Texas with the Pinto, but there is so, so much more to the southern United States than that. And now I'm telling you I may be awake, but I never really are. 
It was great to be able to look out over this landscape, but we got to take it one step farther. This is Sarah's cousin Jake, who took us out in his F-150 to show us the sights. He gave us a tour of the area and some of the fields that he regularly works. Here in this one, you can see one of the pretty unique boats that they use for crawfish trapping. On the back is a steel wheel with cleats that's used to crawl along the bottom. They lay out wire mesh traps in the water, and this bait is used to attract the crawfish. Connecting like fish meal, corn, rice, wheat. Jake even agreed to take us on a lap around the field, so we all hopped into the boat. I had never been on a boat in such shallow water before, and certainly not a boat like this one, so it was a really cool experience. Hey, don't stop, let's do this. Yeah, but you can do a quick swap. Yeah, you know, dump your crawfish. We've been so lucky on this trip to meet such a wide variety of people, but the common connecting factor between all of them is that they showed us kindness. There are so many people out in the world living all sorts of different lives, and we all may have more in common than we think. But if you stay in one place and stick to your own lifestyle, you may never come across these people. This crazy road trip exposed more of the world to me than I had ever seen before, and it's all made possible by the vehicles that took us from place to place and the friends we made along the way. And yes, yeah, saying it out loud, it does come across as a bit cheesy, but it doesn't make it any less true. Not long after getting back to the Prius, the sky finally couldn't hold anymore and it started to rain. We went and had dinner with everyone before heading back to the motel where the Pinto was waiting for us. But before leaving, we were staying another night here, so it would have to wait a little while longer. It continued to rain on and off throughout the night, and by the time we got up at about 9am, it was still going. This made me very glad that we had put the hood back onto the Pinto, so at least all those dodgy electronics weren't getting totally soaked. The rain would probably also help the car run cooler going down the road. But by the time we left the hotel and got to a nearby store, it had stopped. At least, for now. First Prius mod. By this point, Sean had driven the Prius enough that he knew what he did and didn't like about it, and we could try to improve it a little bit. This steering wheel cover should help make the long drive a little bit more comfortable for him. Look how much nicer it is now. I don't know, that seemed just as hard as putting leaf springs on. <laughs> but something that should make an even bigger difference for both him and Rob is topping off the AC. The system was working, but it never got particularly cold, so this was worth a try. How far is this supposed to get? Green. It depends on the car, but like 40 or 45. Cool. Yeah, it's pretty low. A little bit will make a big difference with AC. This way? No. Oh, 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 oh. Too far, too far. Despite some minor difficulties, topping off the system did make a big difference, and now the AC works much better than it did before. It's a little more low pitched now. Another small improvement that we can make is a rear wiper blade that isn't totally falling apart. This is a simple enough swap and an important one to keep from scratching the crap out of that rear glass. Since the Pinto is entirely flawless, it needed no modification. With the three of us back in our two cars, we got back to driving and headed to Scott, Louisiana, about 17 miles away. Something seemed a bit different though, and the whole way there I was getting a strong smell of gasoline. This was made even more noticeable when I rolled the window partway up to block out the rain. 
When we got to the supermarket we were heading towards, we immediately popped the hood and found this. The rear balance tube seal, which I had previously been concerned about but unable to replace up to this point, clearly was not having a great time. Because of the gas vaporizing on the hot engine, this was definitely not something we could ignore and it had to be addressed immediately. Instead, we headed into the supermarket and bought some boudin and other foods for lunch. This place was really cool and the food was inexpensive and fantastic. Sean had been trying to get boudin since we came to Louisiana and this is what Sarah recommended for us. It was pretty spot on. After our shopping spree, we headed back out to the cars and it was clear that the clouds above us were not done for the day. But to keep the Pinto from bursting into flames and farther ruining the reputation of this model, we were going to have to fix that carburetor leak. We took the Prius practically next door to Tractor Supply, hoping that they would have the right size O-rings. Fortunately, I was able to find this assortment and it looks like some of these are just about the right size. But as we headed back to work on the Pinto, the sky opened up and it started absolutely pouring. I hid inside the Pinto and we decided to wait a few minutes to see if it would pass. I could see a little bit of water coming in through the window seals and the hatch seal in the back, but overall the car was doing a pretty decent job at keeping the water out. Which is good because there was no shortage of it coming down. After a few minutes, it was still raining just as hard and we decided to find a gas station with an overhang so that we could get started on fixing that fuel leak. The Pinto's single windshield wiper was still working, but not exactly happily. Here it is on the low setting. And the blazing fast high setting. Yeah, even with only one wiper arm on there, the linkage is either binding up or the motor is failing. So visibility is bad, and the carburetor is still spraying out gasoline, but well, I decided to just take a chance and head down the road to a nearby gas station. Just one mile down the road, we pulled into this station and I quickly shut the engine off. And, because of course it was, 30 seconds later the rain was pretty much done. Well, at least none of us died on the way here and we do have cover from the remnants of the storm, which is much appreciated. For now, the car survived the heavy rain, though when we opened the hood, that familiar gasoline smell sure punched us in the face. My brain cells. To replace that bad o-ring, once again we'll be taking the front ball off of the carburetor so that we can free up the balance tube. Get most of it. <laughs> most of it. The crime. The crime. <laughs> Jesus. Most of it. With all of the front ball screws out, we can pull the balance tube out of the rear one. Oh no, you dropped the o-ring. The culprit? That guy? That guy down there? Oh yeah, okay. I see. We'll also remove the front o-ring and hopefully one from this assortment fits. Thankfully we do have the right sized o-rings. That was a quarter inch inner diameter. Makes sense. Makes sense. This car doesn't make any sense. With the tube and a new o-ring inserted into the front bowl, we'll get that back in place on the carburetor and carefully make sure the rear o-ring gets into place. Then we'll get the bowl screws back in and tighten down. After getting everything back into the car, I slammed the hatch closed and unlike in this recreation, the Pinto badge launched out and fell onto the ground. This was just peak physical comedy and I couldn't believe that the car was still finding new ways to fall apart. In order to keep from losing the badge, for now I just taped over the holes to keep out water. Then we started the car back up and once the carburetor got going, all seemed well. That fuel leak is gone and there's no more gas pooling on the intake manifold. Which is, you know, a good thing. The coolant level also seemed to be holding steady in both the radiator and overflow and while it was a little bit dark in the overflow, it really wasn't too bad. 
So with everything seeming like it's working, we'll get the hood closed back up and start driving. Before beelining out of Louisiana, there was one last place we were told we should stop, which is over in Lafayette. It was only 8 miles away, but the drive went smoothly, and now there wasn't a strong gas smell burning my eyes and lungs going down the road. We stopped for a while at this cool little grocery to get po' boys and give the rain clouds a chance to move away from us. With the weather seeming to clear up a fair bit, it seemed like now was as good a time as any to start heading back towards home. We headed north through town, just enough to get back to I-10 and take that east. The drive was going well, and although there were many fluffy clouds drifting past in the sky, they were all minding their own business. There was still a very high level of humidity, but the high for the day was 85, and it was already dropping. The rain continued to hold off, but as we got towards Baton Rouge, the cloud cover became heavier and heavier, as did the traffic. Luckily for us, both of our cars were handling the crawling just fine as we got onto the Horace Wilkinson Bridge. At one point, the engine temperature dropped below 200, going as low as 190 degrees. Which is with maximum coolant flow through the system, since remember there's no thermostat or restrictor plate or anything in there. I'm pretty sure the 190 sitting in traffic on this bridge was the lowest driving temperature on this entire road trip. We were all pretty set on not messing with the car anymore unless there was something that absolutely had to be done, so at least it was doing better now than it ever had before. Eventually, we did get over that bridge and make our way to I-12, which will take pretty much the rest of the way through the state. Once we got going again, we hugged the right lane and I tried to keep the temperature gauge right about 225, which meant 50 to 60 miles an hour. We were under no assumptions that we'd make it back to Maryland in record time, but we were making a lot of progress. At about 6 o'clock in the evening, we found ourselves at a gas station in Mandeville, Louisiana, about 126 miles from our last stop. One thing that had been bugging me since we left Arizona was that there had never been time to repack the front wheel bearings. And it seemed reasonably safe to assume that nobody else ever had, so they may well have 40-year-old grease in them. While speeding up and slowing down through traffic, I noticed a little bit of noise from the front end, but it didn't seem likely to be the wheel bearings since neither rotor was hot, and it was probably just the road surface interacting with the tires. Either way, it seemed like the car was still rolling along nicely, so we'll get back to the road and let it do just that. Most of this stretch of I-10 heading east is just a straight road surrounded by trees, so the view is not spectacular, but it was a familiar sight and made it feel like we were actually making progress towards getting home. We watched the light drain from the sky as we left Louisiana, drove all the way across Mississippi without stopping, and arrived in Alabama. Just after 9 o'clock, we pulled into a gas station in Mobile, Alabama after driving 120 miles. This marks an important part of the journey because it is our last stop along the southern coast. From here, we'll be leaving I-10 and taking I-65 pretty much directly northeast. We decided to take that longer, southern route to meet up with our friends, but at this point we're starting to get close to our deadline and need to make it home in the next few days. Hopping back in our cars, we got back onto the interstate. By this point, we were certainly no strangers to driving in the dark, but we also had no intentions of pulling any more all-nighters. But we can still appreciate some of the benefits that come with the dark, such as the decreased ambient temperature. This was easily some of the coolest weather on the whole trip, with the night air dipping down to the low 70s. Which the Pinto was very much appreciating, managing to hit 70 miles an hour at a reasonable temperature going down certain slopes. Which is why we made pretty good time for this stretch of the drive, making it 135 miles in just about 2 hours. We arrived in Greenville, Alabama at about 11.30 and stopped at a motel. Unlike a lot of this trip, I was feeling pretty good about how the Pinto was doing. We were about halfway through Alabama, but we were still almost 900 miles from home. If we can continue at this pace, it shouldn't be too much longer, but we still have a lot of time behind the wheel ahead of us. 
For the night, though, we'll settle down in our sketchy motel room and do some, well, questionable reheating of boudin sausage purchased at the supermarket that morning. Sean didn't feel like going back to the car, so he laid it down on, well, Sean, that toilet paper is going to dissolve. Yes, sir. <laughs> In Sean's defense, it took a lot of effort to get the door to the room to latch, and we weren't sure we could do it again if we had to go out to the cars. So, uh, desperate times, I guess. Okay. <laughs> yep, there it goes. Ooh. It's gonna peel off the toilet yeah, paper. Peel the toilet paper off. Eventually, after that horrifying midnight snacking experience, we all got to sleep. We were up again at about 8 in the morning and set about finding the continental breakfast. Of course, we also have to take care of our routine morning checkup. It's not as green as the last one, but it's still actually gross. And after some highly disappointing food, we packed up all of our things and got ready to leave. It's kind of amazing what starts to seem normal after you do it for long enough. This was really just how we started every day. Rolling a suitcase back to the car, looking for dramatic fluid leaks, making sure nothing got stolen since we can't lock the doors, you know, the usual stuff. By this point, I had also been plotting for a while on how to fit a bigger radiator in there, although it wasn't in the cards for this particular trip. I am quite confident that the radiator size isn't the main cooling issue here, but we could fit a slightly larger one, so may as well try in the future. For now, we'll head to the store and pick up supplies for the day, as well as one more thing for the Prius. We only replaced the rear wiper blade previously because Sean was being too cheap to buy new ones, but after all that rain it became pretty clear that it needed them. So now it's time for a new pair in the front. You know, it's so much cheaper if you only have one. Why bother putting that back in? That's true. And just for a little bit of peace of mind, I wanted to take a look at the accessory belt on the Pinto. We popped off the belt that was on there, and it still looks just fine, but clearly it's been losing some material. And it's not like it's old and falling apart, this was a brand new belt that we installed in Arizona. I mean, maybe the crank pulley isn't very aligned, because it is shimmed out like hell, it's not on the register. I'm gonna throw a new one on there that I had just for kicks, I don't think it's gonna change anything. I think it might just be some misalignment since the alternator only has the one mounting point, which isn't great. It hasn't flipped the belt or thrown it or done anything like that, so it seems like a problem we can ignore for now. I don't love that it's turning those V-belts into a fine powder, but it doesn't seem like an imminent threat either. So there's really nothing left to do but close the hood, get gas next door, and get back onto the highway. The high for the day is about 92 degrees, so it's not the most comfortable, but at least it's a pretty day. There is definitely something to be said for blue skies overhead making it feel like things are going maybe a little better than they are. I say that because as we travel north up 65 through Montgomery, Alabama and east on 85 out of there, well the car was getting pretty hot. The Pinto's engine got all the way up to 240 degrees at one point and after I slowed down to 45 or 50 miles an hour it did manage to keep it from climbing above 235 but it didn't really want to cool down from there either. Still we just kept on putting along and after almost 3 hours made it 120 miles to Valley, Alabama. I quickly found a parking lot and popped open the hood to let everything at least radiate out some of its heat. The day wasn't getting any cooler, and in fact the Prius was telling us it was 97 degrees out, so clearly that wasn't helping, but we couldn't afford to keep waiting until night because we had so much distance left to cover. Pretty much our last hope was one little mod that seemed to work for us before. As much as I didn't want to, the hood has to come back off. This is not working. There's also a new rattle and some other sounds. Uh, the belt is still tight, at least. Everything else is uh, not doing fantastic. It's running pretty bad. Should've got a Prius. Nah, Prius. disagree. Runs great. There's a weird rattle. I don't know if it's in the dash or... We're gonna take the hood back off and it's gonna solve all the problems. It was running at 235 that whole time. Yeah. It was not cooling down, it just would not cool down. I still don't know what you're shooting on me, there's like little specks of stuff on my windshield. It's not evaporating. 
That could be coolant from the overflow, considering how full it is, or it could be oil from underneath. With so many different leaks, it becomes a little hard to pinpoint. Unfortunately, we figured it was for the best to remove the grill to ensure we had maximum airflow. Sorry, Ronnie. We'll go back on. Back again, boys. No hood squad. Deja vu. And we'll get the hood carefully strapped back down on the roof. We also took a minute to pull out a spark plug just to make sure things weren't too, too bad in there. It definitely looks to me like it's showing some signs of mild overheating, and this speckling here is probably from a little bit of detonation that's occurring. We'll go around and tighten down the intake manifold again, but we can't really pull any more timing out, so we ended up hanging out here for about an hour and a half to let the car cool down and let the sun move a bit farther across the sky. It was feeling at least a little bit nicer outside, and promising to cool down pretty significantly over the next few hours, which is great because this next stretch of the drive is going to take us right through Atlanta, Georgia, and I'd really like to be able to keep up with traffic and certainly not break down there. Between the ambient temperature and lack of a hood, the Pinto was doing much better and able to maintain about 60 miles an hour at 225 degrees. By the time we got to the city, it was about 6 p.m., so we were in traffic with a lot of people getting off of work on a Tuesday afternoon. Just like every other time we drove this Pinto through a city, it felt strange. Partly because it is a Pinto, it's sort of a car out of time that you don't see very often, and partly because it's loud, slow, and kind of terrible. But once again, because of the reduced speeds, the Pinto actually did quite well here and was staying reasonably cool. We were able to pass through Atlanta without incident and continued northeast up I-85 all the way to Buford, Georgia, 120 miles from our last stop. Just went through Atlanta, it was a little slow but actually not too bad. And it's just about getting dark. I think we got one or two more trips in us tonight. We'll see how it goes. Stayed way cooler with the hood off and just being later in the day, I guess. Sticking right at like 2750 RPM. It's keeping it under 225. Definitely hear the torque converter kind of whirring. A lot of vibration, harmonic vibration. Like a wow, wow, wow that's destroying my body. Notice the angle that nozzle is at when you're filling. It's almost horizontal. And it's full. It doesn't actually fill it to the top of the neck, but it does dribble on the paint every single time. That was 12.72 miles per gallon. While I was refilling my gas guzzler, Sean was trying to figure out how to interface with the Prius. The maintenance required light is on because I changed the oil and I didn't reset it. In order to reset it, press the power button twice with your foot off the brake. And then you use the odometer button to cycle through until you stop on the odometer reading. And then you press the power button once to power your Prius down. And then you press and hold down the odometer button and press the power button twice while you're holding the odometer button with your foot off of the brake. And you continue to hold the odometer button down, wait for the flashing dashes to disappear and your odometer reading to reappear. That's pretty easy, right? why everything in the Prius is a cheat code. Eventually, we got back in our cars and back on I-85 headed northeast. We left Buford at about 9 p.m. and with the 75 degree night air upon us, everything was pretty easy going. This 114 mile stretch was thankfully uneventful and ended with us at a gas station in Greenville, South Carolina. Car's doing good, it was running 212 all the way here, doing probably 65, 2750 RPM, it really likes that. It's a pretty decent pace. I'm trying to make it all the way to Greensboro tonight. The later it got, the cooler it got, and we were really able to pick up the pace. And while the car felt a little bit sketchy doing 70 miles an hour down some of these roads with my level of tiredness, it did all hold together. Other than that, this was another successfully uneventful drive that took us across the North Carolina state line, through Charlotte, and continuing up I-85 into Salisbury. 
As usual, this 128 mile stretch was punctuated with a stop for gas. Car did really well. Sitting about 212 most of the time, doing almost 70 miles an hour at points, 3000 RPM almost the entire time. It's got some real vibration. I assume it's just from the engine. So my body is going numb a bit here, but it was driving really well, honestly. And it made it through that kind of sketchy construction zone, pretty serious bumps. Could have been a lot worse. We left Salisbury headed towards Greensboro, North Carolina, where we had picked out a hotel. Yes, an actual hotel, not a motel this time. We were living at large. And other than feeling pretty sleep deprived, we made the 50 miles there no problem. There was a little bit of confusion that went along with checking in at 2.45 in the morning, but the staff there was very helpful and we got it all sorted out. This was a pretty exciting stop for all of us, because if we're able to maintain our current pace, it will be our last night away from home. Despite having a nice and clean room to sleep in for once, this was a bit of a restless night for me because of how close we finally were to making it. As much as I tried not to, all I could think about were the many things that could still go wrong. But all of that worrying isn't gonna get us back to Maryland. Sleep, though, Sleep would help. As the sun's glow lit up the parking lot outside of our window, we once again gathered up our things and headed out to our cars. That starter is still a bit tenuous, but once the engine starts spinning, it fires up no problem. And, if nothing else, if this gauge is to be believed, the oil pressure is still very good. After a minute or so of warm-up, I can take my foot off the pedal, and the idle settles down to about 1100 RPM in park. We'll head out from the hotel, but we're not going to make it all that far this morning. In fact, we're not even going 10 miles. A friend of ours is at work right now, and for our last planned stop on this trip, we figured we should go see him. And, you know, make him work on the car a little bit, because that's kind of my thing. This is Leon, who has been on the channel a handful of times before. Pretty good. It's been overheating for 2,000 miles, but who cares? Great. Today, just for an hour or two, we're going to hang out with him and his uncle in their heavy-duty truck shop. Our little Pinto is considerably lighter and smaller than pretty much anything that would normally come through here. We'll have to resist making big upgrades to the car while it's here. That's the one we need. That would keep it cool. Here, I'll trade you this 302. You don't is that like a cat engine? What yeah. is that? It's pretty rusty. You can fit this in the Jeep. I mean, yeah, inline six. Yeah. I see no difference. Oh, full service. Well, we have a nice concrete floor and an easy to use, if a bit comically oversized, floor jack. I'd like to give the car a general checkup since it had driven over 1,100 miles after leaving Ronnie's. What jack stands do you got? We got tiny ones. I don't know. Oh god, these weigh more than a pinto. One thing I really wanted to check was the level of fluid in the rear axle since it's been leaking the entire time we've been driving the car. Some of what's on the axle is transmission fluid getting blown back onto it, but a lot of it is gear oil that's probably seeping out of that breather bolt. We'll pop out the fill plug and top it off with more ADW90 oil. Since the car is pitched forward, it might not be the most accurate fill, but it should be good enough. We only actually took about half a quart, so there shouldn't be any damage done or anything like that. Don't have to worry about it the rest of the drive for sure. You ready for it to all wind up on your windshield, though? Yeah, yeah, yeah. After checking everything underneath the car, especially those parking brake cables and the inner sidewall of the rear tires, everything seemed to be okay, so we'll go ahead and set it back down. At the front of the car, I wanted to recheck the timing, so we'll get it started up again. The factory spec for these engines is somewhere around 6 degrees, and that's where we left it the last time we messed with it back in Van Horn, Texas. 
I tried a few different things here, with the intention of putting in a bit more timing, hoping that that would cool the engine down some, but it just really didn't seem to like it. With the timing set at 8 degrees, there is a noticeable decrease in idle quality when the vacuum advance is connected. With the high idle RPM in park and no adjustment to the canister, it's pulling in something like 6 to 8 degrees. It really seems to not like that extra timing, so we're just going to leave it back at 6 degrees initial where it was. At least, compared to the other times we had a timing light on the car, it seemed very consistent. Since that wasn't going anywhere, we'll move to the one last thing I wanted to do on the car before we left North Carolina. We had ordered a new pair of hatch lift struts back in Texas, but never got a chance to install them. The first hurdle turned out to be the screws that hold the lower side strut mount to the body of the car. Unsurprisingly, they were all loose, and there were supposed to be three per side, but one on the passenger side was already missing. I figured the least we could do is take out the two remaining screws and lock tight them so that they stay in there. Which seemed like a good idea until I dropped one of them. Uh, oh, look at what you've done. That's gone forever now. Yep. Don't worry. I'll <laughs> capture the search on camera. I'm already off to a great start. Yeah, do you have any big screws? <laughs> <laughs> you've done it now, Mike. It would seem that I have. Well, anyway, how does that attach? Just pull. Maybe it's a ball joint thing. It looks like a ball joint thing. It was just a ball joint thing, there just wasn't any kind of release mechanism, so you had to get a little bit rough with it. The ball studs that came with the new struts matched the ones on the car, so we're just gonna grease and reuse the old ones. These are great. I don't know why you replaced them. I think that's how they're supposed to work. Well, at least both of the old ones were off of there, and the new ones could go on. You get these attached and then as soon as you try to close it, it just rips the trim panel off because there's too much pressure. Yeah, that's why I'm worried about the screws. Why are you taking that off when you can just like pop them out like ball joints? I'm taking it out because I need a screw for the other side. No, don't do that. But yeah, this one doesn't want to come off. I sent her a little too hard there, bud. Oh, you just broke the end off the old yeah. one. Each of the lower mounts got tightened down with two of the original countersunk screws and one bolt that I kind of shoved in there but they felt a lot more solid than they did previously. <laughs> we can throw the stick in the trash now. Oh god, those are strong. Oh yeah. Gotta oh, be yeah. careful with that. Yeah. When you put that Pinto badge back on, you open it, it's, yeah. it's pulling it. You gotta pull your Pinto <laughs> badge oh, all the way over. No, I glued the hell out of that thing. Yay. Don't use the stick anymore, but we need to keep it just in case. Don't close it too hard, Jesus. <laughs> there goes the gas tank. I was probably a little bit too excited for such a small thing, but I don't know, it just made it feel like so much more of a car. Not long after this important upgrade, we were ready to head out, and I had to make sure everything in the car was in order for the last 300 miles. You hear do that? Funny spoiler. Efficiently organized rear storage receptacle. Check. Dual layered seat cushion rated for the resonance of high speed driving. Check. Advanced aftermarket floor mount cup holders. Big check. Ready to go home, boys? Hey, 495 traffic? Yay, 495, 495. It'll probably take six or seven hours. I texted you uh, the gas station. We said goodbye to Leon and filled the car up before leaving Greensboro and aimed for a station 122 miles away. It was another warm day in the high 90s, and while the Pinto wasn't doing too bad at first, once we started hitting some of the hills, the engine got pretty hot and stayed there. I did what I could to keep it under about 235, but it was riding pretty close to that most of the way. Depending on the steepness of the hill, we would climb at 24 to 2600 RPM and then cruise down at about 28. That seemed to be doing the trick as far as keeping it below 240, but maintaining a half decent speed. Once again, despite the heat, the car refused to quit and we made it all the way to South Hill, Virginia. The car was very unhappy coming over the hills. It was running 230, 235 the whole way. It's about 98 degrees right now outside, even with the hood off. Not good enough. That 120 miles, still doing good mileage wise. We sat there for about half an hour before deciding to just get back out on the road. 
It was just late enough in the day that the air around us was starting to cool down a little bit, and luckily much of this stretch of I-85 is shaded by trees. Thanks to this, we were able to go a little bit faster than the previous stretch, but the Pinto's gauge was still stuck at about 230 degrees. At one point, the road was looking pretty empty, and Sean came up next to me, flooring it in the Prius. Once I saw what he was doing, I did the same, and the Prius started to pull ahead. The Pinto pretty much stopped dead over three grand, and was pinging as bad as anything I've ever heard. If there was any confirmation that the engine was doing worse and worse, and the temperature really was as high as the gauge says it is, that was it. It didn't explode though, and after losing to the Prius, we made it all the way to Colonial Heights, Virginia, which was only about 60 miles from our last stop, but we were gonna wait till it got darker. The moment we stopped, there was a pretty close call in the parking lot, and I narrowly avoided getting hit by a cocky Toyota driver but luckily the Pinto made it out of that scrape without combusting. To celebrate, we hung out in a nice air-conditioned restaurant for the next hour and a half. By around 8.30, it had gotten much cooler outside, and that was our cue to leave. Back in the Pinto, I took off headed north up I-95 with Sean and Rob trailing behind. If it hadn't previously been obvious, the reason they're following behind most of the time is that I kinda have to set the speed we drive at to keep from melting the engine into a pile of slag. I made a lot of jokes about them ditching me, but really, they never did. Sean had wanted to buy that car anyway, and, well, now was a pretty good time to get one for a good price down in Texas, and not have to keep sitting in the Pinto. I can't lie, I really like a lot of things about this car, and I want to love it, but it has been making it very hard to. So I do understand why they would rather sit in just about anything other than that car. I'm saying all this now because when we made it the 50 miles to Ruther Glen, Virginia, we were gonna part ways. We were getting very close to our July 2nd deadline for getting everyone home, and because we had been gone so long, there were some things they had to take care of. I'm getting ditched again. This is important. It'll be okay. The whirring noise is definitely getting louder. I don't know what that is. Maybe keep it at 220, huh? We'll see. I'll try. It's running so bad now. I don't know. Bye. Seriously, no hard feelings at all. They put up with me and my car for weeks, and I really didn't have any problems with making the last drive solo. So much of this trip happened and went as well as it did thanks to other people's help. But at the end of the day, I chose this car. It's kind of my fault that the trip has been as difficult as it has. So, in spite of all the people that made this happen, it kind of felt right to end the trip this way. Just me, driving through the dark, bringing the Pinto home. This final leg of the journey was over 100 miles north, up 95 and 495, heading over the border into Maryland. There was the expected amount of traffic, and the car stayed reasonably cool through this, mostly around 225 degrees, but it was hard not to notice how badly it was running crawling through traffic. The idle was getting pretty rough, and it seemed like it was having more and more trouble accelerating, and I was just really hoping it was down to vacuum leaks at the intake manifold. Whatever the cause, when the road opened back up, it was able to cruise along with traffic pretty well. In fact, even rolling along at 70 miles an hour, the gauge was dropping below 200. It got down to 70 degrees outside, and between that and the significantly faster pace than it had been driving at all day, it was a nice peaceful ride. The best part, though, was turning into the driveway. Yeah, we made it. I pulled the car up to the garage, parked it next to all the other junk, and after shutting it off, just sat there. Holy shit. Rob and I had each been away from our homes for 19 days, and Sean, 22. 
After landing in Vegas, we covered over 3,300 miles of road across 12 states. It may not have been pretty, but this was the biggest adventure of my life. We made it. It's kind of surreal. It was really weird driving back here. You know, obviously it's familiar, but <laughs> not on this car. Whenever I told anyone where we would be, they would ask when we'd be back. And I didn't really have an answer. The only thing I could tell them was before July 1st. And uh, look at that. As usual, it's uh, as close as it could possibly be cut, but it's not July yet. And now it is. For now, I'm going to throw something on the car since it might rain and get some freaking sleep. I really didn't want to do much of anything after all that driving, but I figured the least I could do for the car would be to reinstall the hood. So we'll get all the ratchet straps undone and just set it on top of the hinges, because that's good enough for now. For me, the strangest part wasn't coming home that night or even sleeping in my own bed or anything like that. The weirdest part was coming out the next morning and having the car just sitting there. Like, nonchalant, as if we hadn't just fought with it for weeks to get it there. And not long into the day, I was glad I took the time to reinstall the hood because the forecast calling for rain was correct. And not just a little bit either. A lot. Like, a lot. After just a few short stints of driving it in the rain, I was very glad to have missed this storm. At least the fateful steed should be pretty clean after this. I really can't overstate how odd it felt to be looking at this car through those familiar garage door windows. Really, I think it was probably a couple of days before the reality of everything from the trip kind of set in. And if the car wasn't sitting out in the driveway, I wouldn't have thought it was real. I wouldn't have thought we made it. At times, many times, it seemed like we weren't going to. But we didn't give up. We sort of couldn't, that was kind of the idea. On the long road home, the car turned out to be a magnet for stories, and not just our own. We could hardly stop at a red light without motorists swapping anecdotes. Seeing a Pinto for the first time in decades brought so much joy to others, and they continuously shared those latent memories with us. Stories inspire adventure, and ours started around a campfire. Before we knew it, friendship, will, and luck were dragging us through an odyssey of our own. And now that it's here, it's just another of the fleet. It might be alarming to hear this, but there are still a few problems with the Pinto that need addressing. So while well, this is the end of a wild road trip, it's just the beginning of this project. Way back from out of the dry lands my grandfather's strong hands, they built this home. Wielding an axe and a hand drill, and a mountain of raw skill, he built it to last. started to fall the drought hit and then came the dust bowl it carried the topsoil away in a gust sawmill to pay for the crop bills and hope they would grow he went home with all of the scrap wood and did all that he could to finish the house
A hot day beneath the veranda. I went to stand up. It hit me at once. He's gone now, but not what he left us. This home that kept us connected to him. Some things are built to last. Some things are built to last. The ones we love are gone so fast. But some things are built to last. Okay, it's over. We did it. Buying the car, working on it, road tripping it, filming it, editing the videos, it's all done. This has been, by an incredible margin, the largest project this channel has undertaken. And of course, I need to once again stress that we weren't alone in this. All of you out there watching, commenting, sending me threatening emails asking when part four is coming out, thank you. Maybe some of you could ease up on the enthusiasm just a little bit, but it is all appreciated. And as for everyone who laid hands on the car, why'd you let me do this? What the hell's wrong with you? And, you know, thanks and stuff. But I don't forgive you and don't let me do it again. Please, I'm down with